Hello everyone, welcome to my video channel. Today I am going to talk about traction in orthopedic setting. I will talk about what is traction. Traction that can be divided into skin traction, skeletal traction, fixed traction. I will elaborate more regarding autonomous spleen traction. What is sliding traction? The general complication of traction. And finally, one of my exam question. How do you insert a table pin for traction? In part 2 of traction in orthopedic setting, I will cover exam questions such as 1. What is Gardner wheel skull tongue? Complication and weight calculation for cervical traction. And 2. Regarding statement pin, its specification, the uses, the sizes and surgical technique. As an introduction, what is the definition of traction? It is the application of a pulling force to achieve a desired purpose. For an effective application of traction, there must be something to pull against, which is the opposite direction, referred to as a counter traction. There are four methods of applying traction. Number one is the skin traction. Number two, the skeletal traction. Number three, fixed traction. And finally, number four, is a sliding traction. I will describe regarding each of the traction after this. For number one, the skin traction. The pulling force is exerted tangentially along the skin by using an adhesive strapping attached to the cord and weight. The traction force is applied over a large area. This will spread the load and is more comfortable and efficient. The force applied is transmitted from the skin to the bone via a superficial fascia, deep fascia and intermuscular septa. In skin traction, for better efficiency, the traction force is applied only to the limb, distal to the fracture. Skin traction can be either adhesive or non-adhesive in nature. For adhesive strapping, prepare the skin by washing and applying a tincture benzoin which protects the skin and acts as an additional adhesive. Please avoid strapping the bony prominences. To prevent the development of blisters, the skin traction needs to be applied without folds or crease in the adhesive material and the covering bandage should be non-elastic. One of the adhesive strip is satisfactory in place by ensuring that the padded lower section overlies the malleoli. A spiral in elastic bandage is carefully wrapped around the limb from just above the malleoli to the top of the strip. Please leave a loop of 2 inches around 5 cm projecting beyond the distal end of the limb to allow the movement of finger or foot. Applying the overlying bandage spirally overlapping by half. For non-adhesive skin traction, this consists of length of soft ventilated latex form rubber laminated into a strong closed backing. Non-adhesive skin traction is useful in thin and atrophic skin or when there is sensitivity to adhesive strapping. Application of non-adhesive strapping is similar to adhesive strapping. As the grip is less secure, frequent reapplication may be necessary. Attached traction weight should be less than 5.5 kg or 10 lbs or pound. What are the complications of skin traction? Again, the maximum weight is around 4.5 kg. If much more than 8 pound is applied for some length of time, it may result in A. Pressure necrosis B. Skin blistering C. Superficial layer of skin being pulled off D. Migration of the bandage may occur with lower weights E. Allergy For number 2 Skeletal traction. Pin or similar device is applied directly through the bone. 
it enables a greater force to be used, especially in cases, example, femur fracture, vertically unstable pelvic ring injuries, and acetabular fracture dislocation. But the problem with skeletal traction is, it may result in infection into the bone through the pin or screw insertion site. Among the pins that can be used are stamen pin or threaded than ham pin. Both are more preferred than the wire because they prevent early loosening of the device. Skeletal traction is used as a means of reducing or maintaining the reduction of a fracture. Skeletal traction should be reserved to those cases in which skin traction is contraindicated. Again, the skeletal traction is attached directly to the bone by providing a strong, steady, continuous pull and can be used for a prolonged period of time. For maintenance of the skeletal traction, 10% of patient's body weight is sufficient. Example, if patient is 80 kg, 8 kg of weight traction is sufficient for the patient. Number three, a fixed traction. The traction is applied against a counter force applied to the patient's body. The, the pull is exerted against a fixed point. Example, tapes are tied to the cross piece of a, of a Thomas splint and the leg pulled down until the root of the limbs abuts against the ring of the splint, as illustrated in the picture of the right hand corner. To simplify, a fixed traction is where the traction is applied to the leg against a fixed point of counter pressure. Example include fixed traction in Thomas Plain, Roger Anderson, well leg traction, hello pelvic traction. Now, let's dive in into one of my exam questions. How do you measure the Thomas Plain? Traction. So we are going to measure by the oblique circumference of the thigh immediately below the greater fold of the buttock and ischial tuberosity. This may be too painful on the affected leg. So measure the unaffected leg and add around 5 to 6 cm to accommodate for the swelling. Number 2, this measurement should correspond with the internal circumference of the Thomas plane ring. Number three, measure the distance from the groin to the heel and add around 15 to 25 cm to allow for plantar flexion of the foot. Number four, the distance should correspond to the medial or inner sidebar of the spleen. Okay, this measurement is adapted from the Stewart and Hallett 1983. So earlier, I already show you an illustration of the components of the Thomas Plain. I do hope you guys could appreciate and understand the illustration. The last one on the list of traction is sliding traction, whereby the patient weight is balanced against an applied load, utilizing a frictional and gravitational force to counterbalance the applied traction. In sliding traction, the amount of weight is determined by the inclination of the bead, as illustrated in the above picture. Next, I am going to talk about the uses of traction in orthopedic setting. Among them include 1. To relieve pain due to muscle spasm. Maintaining the limb in a position of comfort and rest by relaxing the muscles in anatomical position. 2. To restore and maintain the alignment of the bone following fracture and dislocation. Number 3. Help to restore the blood flow and the nerve function. Number 4. To rest the injured or inflamed joints and maintain them in a functional posi position. Example, Use of traction in Pertis disease. 
Number 5 to gradually correct the deformities due to contraction of the soft tissue caused by disease or injury. Number 6, informing rest and enforcing rest. Example, in patient who has a back pain. I am covering regarding a general complication of traction. Among them include A. Prolonged bed stay that will lead to complications such as deep vein thrombosis, DVT, PE, pulmonary embolism, orthostatic pneumonia. B. Distraction of the fracture if excessive force is applied. C. Infection of the pins, example that leads to osteomyelitis. D. Excessive traction causing traction injury, example neuropraxia. Another favorite question from my lecturer is, why do you insert a proximal tibia pin traction from the lateral side of the cuff to the middle side? And or from the middle side of the calcaneal or anchor joint to the lateral side for a calcaneal pin traction. So please remember, among the devastating complications of skeletal traction include damage to the neurovascular structure, local soft tissue infection, osteomyelitis, infection of the bone, thermal injury and physical injury, especially in the young children. The reason is we are trying to avoid the neurovascular structure during insertion of the pin. So there always must be a safe zone. Another question is how do you insert a tibial pin traction and what are the landmark? We start with lateral starting point, 2 cm distal and 2 cm posterior to the tibial tubercle. Or we can use a 2.5 cm distal and 2.5 cm posterior. This is the safe placement of traction pins. This is to minimize the damage to the common peroneal nerve. During insertion of the pin, we are able to control the entry trajectory but unable to control the exit trajectory. Another landmark that we can use is 1 to 2 finger breath below the tibial tuberosity in the mid portion of the tibia. There is an illustration about the direction of the pin insertion. Contraindication of proximal tibia pin insertion include ligament injury to the ipsilateral knee due to loss of ligamento taxis component. Please avoid using in children. There is a risk of damaging to the tibial physis that may lead to gene recovatum. Another thing to be careful is doing traction is in osteoporotic patient. It should be used in caution due to fragility of the bone because it may result in traction pin pulling through the bone. What are the advantages of proximal tibial pin insert traction versus distal femoral pin traction? 1. Anatomical landmarks on the proximal tibia are more reliable and identifiable compared to the distal femur. Especially in the trauma setting whereby the soft tissue swelling and body habitus may obscure landmarks that may otherwise be recognizable. 2. Subcutaneous nature of the proximal tibia compared to the soft tissue envelope surrounding the distal femur may allow for a easier passage of the traction pins. But in setting of multi-legamentous injury and or, or knee dislocation, skeletal traction through proximal tibia is not indicated. Oops, oh, another additional notes. Another consideration during proximal tib tibial, pin tra tra tibial pin insertion is there is an extension of the knee capsule distal to the knee joint, around 14 mm. It is essential to place the proximal tibial traction pin extra capsula and greater than 14 mm length in order to be at a safe distance away from the knee joint and to avoid intracapsular penetration causing a septic knee joint. 
Whew, finally, we have reached to the end of the video. In part 2 of traction in orthopedic setting, I will try to cover regarding Gardner Well skull tong, its complication and weight calculation for cervical traction. Number 2, regarding stem and pin traction, its specification, the uses, the sizes and the surgical technique involved. Number 3, regarding the sites of skeletal traction. So, I do hope you have learned something from this video. See you again. Bye.